Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Dr. Andrew Woods is training us on how to sell our products and services to the 1.4 billion people who live in China. Andrew, I've got three questions that will help us get to know you. The first okay. question is this. What's the wildest thing that you have ever done? I think the wildest thing I've ever done is actually when I just one day decided to up sticks in 2008 and go to China with no contacts, no uh, nothing. Just wanted to explore and wanted to see what it was all about and wound up spending close to 15 years there. Wow, that's a pretty wild thing. Question number two, what are the top qualities that attract you to people? Um, I think, you know, and it would probably be a lot of these people in, in this group is sort of uh, people that go for it, people that don't make excuses, that really uh, grab life and, and run with it and, and take opportunities and risk. Action takers. That's action takers. Like, perfect. Good for you. Uh, and the final question is, what would you describe as one of your special talents? Um. I think I, one of the things I love is keeping in touch with people. So I, I've had the opportunity to live in many different countries over the years and, and, uh, and um, through my teaching career and also a business career, I've, I've met many people and I just love keeping in touch with them. Even if there's nothing in it, uh, monetary, just, just, just keeping those relationships. I love building and sustaining long-term relationships with people. Lovely. You're, uh, you're a rare person. A lot of people just let relationships slide away. Good for you. Now, uh, participants, if you have questions during Andrew's uh, workshop, uh, would you type them into the chat and then I will batch them and post it and pose them to Andrew about every 15 minutes during his talk. You're going to be sent a link to the recording of Andrew's workshop in a few hours, subject to technical, everything technical going according to plan. Uh, nevertheless, I encourage you to take notes because the very act of taking notes is going to increase what you absorb uh, by as much as 25 to 30%. Andrew, are you ready to knock our socks off? I am ready to knock your socks off, guys. Take it away. She's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Okay. So um, first of all, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, coming out today. And uh, I'm going to continue. Uh, am I letting people in, Roger? Or are you? No, I've taken over that job. That's fabulous. Great. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I said at the beginning, I didn't want to make any jokes because I've just had surgery a few days ago and I'm in a bit of pain when I laugh or cough. But I am the stereotypical Zoom presenter. I have a jacket tie on and a pair of shorts underneath. Um, so I think that... Uh, Without further ado, I, I shall move on, uh, trying not to laugh and trying not to cough. Uh, right, so so we're here today to talk about doing business in China, and uh, you know, looking at the, the the people coming online and seeing seeing the the the, the various people joining. Um, I'm sure many of you have already been to China. Some of you have done business there. Some of you have a deep knowledge of certain areas. Some of you don't. I'm acting on the assumption that I'm starting from scratch with you guys, but I'm happy to answer questions that are more detailed or discuss those at a later time. Um, a little bit about my background. I think I already mentioned that I wound up in China um, 2008 uh, full time. I'd been there a few times before that. Um, but during that time, I, I uh, immersed myself in the culture. I studied a lot. Um, I, I put myself through a, a doctorate in management all focused on Chinese business and entrepreneurship, and in particular, uh, a topic that we'll get in later, which is uh, something that's kind of uh, mystical, uh, is the art of Guangxi. Um, but I'll hit on that afterwards. So a little bit about my background, and then it, it's not really about me, but I'll just give you a little bit of background so you know who I am. Um, I've had the opportunity to deliver um, seminars on doing business in China, cross-cultural communication, uh, and, uh, and uh, selling to China in 22 countries. Um, in 2018, I had the honor of uh, being an editor and contributor to the Shanghai Inward Investment Guide for the government of, of China. Um, just recently, I wrote uh, Guangxi in Modern China, which is something I've, I've, uh, I'll, I'll expand on a little bit later. Um, 
been involved very heavily since 2013 with sort of being a bridge between Western companies and Chinese companies. Um, you may notice that it says ASEAN as well, been do doing a lot of work recently with Vietnam, but that's not what we're talking about today. Um, had the great honor of being asked to be a professor of entrepreneurship and cross-cultural communication at EM Lyon Business School, which is a French business school with a campus in Shanghai, uh, top 30 MBA program of the world. So it was really quite an honor. And of course, as I mentioned before, I had the opportunity to live for 15 years in China. If you took all of the things above what I say on the last point, 15 years living in China, the rest of it is not worth it. The, re the reading of books and the studying, uh, I never tell people don't study, it's very valuable, but I read probably every conceivable book at the time when I went over to China and it was nothing as I expected. Um, so the on the ground experience is priceless for, for engaging with people and learning the culture. Okay. So uh, this is a view of uh, Shanghai. Just to give you those uh, that haven't been there, the idea of the enormity and the sheer size of, of, the, uh, of the country in general. I mean, you're talking 1.4 billion people. So you're talking, I believe the United States is getting close to 400 million. So you're talking a considerably larger. The city of Shanghai that I have pictured up on the screen is larger in population than the country of Australia and knocking on the door of, of uh, Canada, really. I mean, I think we're at 36 in Canada and Shanghai can be said anywhere between 20 and 30. They don't have uh, uh, a thorough detailed number because there are many migrant uh, people that come to the, uh, like the way people go to New York to make their fortunes. A lot of uh, Chinese go to uh, Shanghai to make theirs. Um, is an interesting quote. Um, and I think it holds true today, although this slide was one I used in 2014 or 15 at, a, at, a, at an event, and I pulled it out again. Um, the literal translation of this is, may you live in interesting times. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, if you asked me 20 years ago, would I have spent 15 years living in China, be married to a Chinese woman and immersed in a Chinese family, I would have said you are completely insane. So. The world that we live in is so fabulous that we, you know, we can do these things so much more readily than we could uh, 20, 30 years ago uh, and before that. So uh, it certainly is an interesting time. The, the late comedian uh, George Carlin um, uh, spoke very close to his death about the, how honored he was to be living in this time when he could watch the rise of China, the rise of Russia, the, the changing of the world order. And I feel very blessed that I sat there at a front row seat to it all and still am very connected to all the changes that are going on, whether we like them or not. Um, you know, the, the status quo might not change, but certainly China will be a very major impact as it is already in all of our lives. So I, I you know, I told you at the beginning, I, I'm a professor and I teach at a business school. So there's gotta be a little bit of facts and figures in here. Um, you know, we have three different types of ways, well, we have multiple ways of measuring GDP, uh, but when we have GDP, the standard way, which is per capita, we have GDP, uh, gross domestic product um, of a country, and we have uh, PPP, which is purchasing power parity. Uh, China's already the world's largest economy and has been for many years based on purchasing parity. Um, it's set to take over the United States anywhere between 2028 and 2030. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it, I guess it comes down to the third point though, that there's still a lot of inequality in the sense that the GDP per capita is about sitting at around 10,000 USD. Um, whereas for a country like Canada, it's a pushing upwards of four, uh, 50. So you have a, a, a country that's so massive and you have pockets of extreme wealth. You have a middle class of 400 million people which is a little bit larger than the United States, who can afford uh, most international Western uh, products. And that's what I'm here to talk about tonight is the opportunities that I've noted uh, exist over my time there, and those have changed considerably. Um, and I'll talk about kind of ways in which we can tap into that, or you might want to look at tapping into that. So first of all, you've probably read a lot about this, um, more so in the last year or so than, than prior to that. Uh, but it's a concept of one belt, one road, uh, Ida Ilu, which is 
the uh, almost one could could argue it's a grandiose Marshall Plan. It's a it's a 2021 uh, version, although it started in in 2013, I believe. And it's the president of China, Xi Jinping, it's as a leader of China, his grandiose plan of, of reviving the old Silk Road trading um, uh, routes. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's mired right now in a little bit of controversy. You probably read some negativity about it and some positive things about it. Um, but it just shows you the clout that over a trillion dollars is being invested in this program to build, uh, to release excess capacity from the, the Chinese market. Uh, but to build a network across uh, um, going from China, instead of going um, uh, eastward out of China towards the Pacific, it's going westward out towards Europe uh, and linking a lot of places around the world. Um, and this is something that presents a lot of opportunities for Western firms, Western technology, um, but it's mired in controversy right now. And, and, uh, and it's a shame. I, I always say to people, you know, I, 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 people have their differing opinions of doing business in China, of political systems. I don't get involved with that side. I'm purely involved with relationship building and helping people to do business. I don't want to get involved in the politics. I'm very aware of it on both sides, both sides, Western politics and Eastern or China politics. Uh, both have their faults, if you ask me. But uh, I'm here to talk about business opportunities and not politics. But one thing that's uh, uh, coming up a lot, which is quite interesting, and it's been in the news recently, which some of you might be familiar with, is a concept that was coined by a gentleman called Graham Allison, who is a professor out of Harvard, uh, um, who, who um, teaches Chinese um, uh, history and politics. And he wrote a book, Destined for War. Uh, and I get asked this question a lot, um, you know, are the United States, are, are, are we destined for war? I don't think it's gonna happen, but I don't know, of course. Um, but I think that, you know, people are people and, and we need to focus on the trade opportunities and the, the, what I love about China is the idea that people are more interested in having a better life, building a better life for themselves. Um, so this whole concept of Thucydides trap, I'll, I'll backtrack, is this idea that if we look back on history, right back to the Peloponnesian Pol War, that a, a, ri a rising power and the status quo power have almost always had conflict. So Allison's idea in the book is that it's almost inevitable that there will be conflict. I'm less pessimistic about that. I think that our economies, Western economies in China are too intertwined for there to be actual conflict. I think there'll be a lot of uh, rhetoric, but there won't be conflict. I was asked earlier in the conversation if I, I thought people in Canada perhaps or in the US were a little bit nervous about doing business in China. I don't think they should be. I think they should diversify, but I think they should look at all the opportunities. So the opportunities of tapping into this market are, are, are truly substantial. But the rules of the game have changed considerably. When I first went over to China in sort of early 2000s, it was expected that the Chinese party would speak English or have English interpreters the Western party wouldn't be really familiar with Chinese etiquette, Chinese culture. Those rules, those things have changed considerably. Now I'm not talking about the executive who goes in once and then leaves and just comes for a couple of days, but I'm talking about the people that live there and do business on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. They're expected now more to be familiar with the language, familiar with the culture and do business on Chinese terms in my experience, as opposed to doing them on Western terms. So definitely, when one goes over to um, Asia or China in general to do business, they need to be prepared for culture shock. And they need to have a clear mind where they say, okay, things are done differently, but I'm going to adapt to that. I'm in someone else's country. And believe me, I've seen this and I've trained in this for years, the importance of treating the other party with respect in particular in Chinese culture will serve you very well in growing your business um, in China. So, I mentioned earlier before we hit into to specifics, um, I mentioned earlier um, Guangxi and Guangxi is a um, sort of an interesting debated concept, uh, whether it's relevant or whether it's not relevant anymore in China. After spending nearly five years studying a PhD primarily revolving around the concept, I don't even know if I have an answer whether it's relevant or not relevant. I think it's relevant in a lot of situations, but let me explain what it is. It's the concept of reciprocity and relationships 
It's very uniquely uh, Chinese in character. But I guess if you could compare it to something perhaps in the UK, you would call it the old boys club. It's really relevant everywhere. It's the connections that you know and how you can leverage those connections. Where Guangxi is a little bit different to the old boys club is that you almost have a system where you give favors, but those favors have to almost have to be returned in kind or to a higher level. And what's unique about this is it very often can lead if gone unchecked into uh, areas that are seen as corrupt or, or bringing corruption. And it's a very tricky um, obstacle course to, to, to a minefield to, to deal with. So um, again, I always give advice to people, as I say, if you're uncertain about something, seek advice. And if you're uncertain about the legalities of something, don't do it. Um, but uh, a, a wonderful concept of relationships and relationship building and very important. Uh, but don't, there's two things I want you guys to take away from this. I'd like you to take away more, but there's two things. And they are, um, first of all, Guangxi, you can do business in China without Guangxi, but Guangxi helps. And number two, anybody that calls themselves a Chinese expert, run away. Uh, it's like somebody who lives in New York who calls themselves a United States expert. You don't want to be going and asking advice on how to do business in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, or, uh, or um, you know, uh, uh, Honolulu. It's a very different, amazing country with very different, different regional tastes, preferences, uh, food tastes, um, ways of thinking, um, just a massive, massive country. But those two things are things to take away are, you know, it, you do your homework and, and pick out the areas that you want to target. And we'll talk about that as we move on further. It's a massive place. This is something I just popped in here because I had this conversation come up the other day. Um, and I've had it come up in the past is that um, I find, and this is a gross generalization, but I'm going to throw it out there. I find that in my experience, not only is, is, is China, of course, more of a collective society as opposed to an individualistic society like perhaps the United States, uh, but also I find the thinking styles are very different. Um, I think in the Western world, and again, this is changing, I think we encourage more right brain thinking. We encourage uh, creativity. We encourage a lot of originality. Um, I found in my time in China teaching hundreds, if not thousands of students over the years in business school, uh, working with executives, uh, executive coaching, etc. I found that it's much more of a left uh, brain thinking, more analytical, uh, logical, sequential, as opposed to creative way of thinking. And I think that's important to think about when you're actually pitching products. And when you're dealing with other cultures, as I said, it'll serve you so well when you're trying to do business with China to understand the culture a little bit more um, and understand that there's different thinking styles and different ways of perceiving the, the wider world, if you will. Um, but let me continue. This is something that threw me off guard at the beginning. Uh, being a, uh, growing up in Canada and living, living in the US, living in the UK, Ireland, Italy over the years before going to, um, to uh, uh, China, for me, a yes was a firm yes and a no was a firm no. And what I discovered very quickly was that very often we have this notion in China, um, and again, these are generalizations. I think the younger crowd are quite different. And that's very interesting to, to note that dealing with generations is quite different as it is in, in the Western world, but dealing with generations is quite different and regions of, of China. But I was surprised many times that I would be overly enthusiastic in, in trying to sell training or sales training or whatever it was that I was selling at the time. And uh, I'd get a lot of yeses, which I later realized were often no's and ways of not um, hurting my feelings or, or upsetting me or upsetting the status quo or, or causing me to lose face. Now that I understand that, it makes doing business a little bit more easy. Um, and like I said, there's so many of these small things that we need to know when taking the plunge into this area. So um, another thing that I noticed in my time in China, in particular in the last um, few years and more in the tier one cities, I'll get into that afterwards, but since I brought it up, I guess I'll get into it now. We have different rankings of cities. So you would have uh, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, which would be classified as tier one cities. These are cities that are no different and in some ways more advanced than a lot of Western cities. Um, 
cost of living is quite high, disposable income among most quite high, uh, ability to buy Western products very easy if they want them, if they feel that there's an advantage or a value add. You then go on to tier two and tier three cities and we'll hit on that afterwards. But what I'm discovering mostly now is that there's a massive shift towards health products. <clears throat> I said I'd try not to cough, <laughs> excuse me. Um, there's a massive shift towards health products in the, in the recent years, there's been uh, some food scares in uh, China where um, products have been tainted. There's been challenges with these products. So a lot of, um, and again, that's changing, but a lot of Western products are perceived as more, uh, possibly more pure, certainly products from Canada, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, things like milk powder, baby milk powder. Some of you might be familiar with the scandal we had uh, over milk powder a few years ago in China, where there was uh, found to be uh, added chemicals to uh, to change the uh, the uh, content of the uh, of the product, um, which actually caused death in some cases. So health products from from uh, Western countries are very big right now. Uh, this changes quite often uh, to what sort of the flavor of the month um, uh, or a year. Uh, it used to be years ago that Western fashion products were massive in China. They still are, but that's there's a lot of local products that are domestic products that are competing very nicely. Um, and it will be the case with health products um, as well. Um, but I find that that's sort of an area for Western people to look at as sort of health products, supplements, vitamins, um, certain food categories, um, certain technologies, but uh, a lot of the technologies there are as advanced and in many cases more advanced. Um, but anyway, these are these are some things um, moving forward. So I mentioned this notion of the tier cities. You have cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, which are massive mega cities, uh, 20, 25 million plus um, cities that um, I've spent time in all of them and they're fabulous and uniquely different. Um, but the tier one cities are really no different from any, from New York, London. I mean, of course they have certain differences, but, uh, but you can find whatever you're looking for there and you have disposable income. You have tier two, which would be uh, Ningbo, Qingdao, Chengdu, these type of cities. Again, massive cities, the scale, as I tried to get it with the picture, the scale, you know, if you, if you're running a business and you can tap into one of these cities and kind of get a piece of it, it's just the scale is unbelievable. Um, you have tier two, you have tier three, and you have tier, tier four. The tier three and tier four are, are, are still underdeveloped, but developing rapidly. Um, and it depends what your products are. It used to be that the big companies would set up in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. Now they're starting to look more at tier two, tier three, and in some cases, tier four cities as to where they want to break in and how they want to break in. Um, so there's different ways of, and different cities and, and uh, you know, my, I can help you with that or other, other people out there can help you with that or you can do your own research if you have a unique product where you wanna set that up and what the best plan of attack is. This is a really interesting one because I get asked regularly, I get told, which, which kind of infuriates me actually, but people say, well, there is no social media in China. Oh, wow, what, what an understatement that is. Um, the social media ecosystem there is, is in many ways far more advanced than what we have in the Western world. Um, there are super apps that you're familiar with. I have WeChat listed here on the side, which can pretty much do anything. Um, you know, you people pay their bills on it. You have FinTech in China, which is again, far more advanced. A lot, a lot of things are paid for using WeChat. Um, a lot of banking is done via that. Um, but you just have a plethora of different platforms and, and, and ways in which people can, uh, can use um, these, these uh, social media apps. Roger, did you have any questions at, at this point or shall we continue? There, um, there are no questions whatsoever. So you just, oh. ca you just carry on. Okay, oh. fabulous. So in the social media mix, you know, we have a lot of people come at me and they say, well, what about censorship? What about, um, you know, and yeah, that, that's a fact of, of, of one party rule. That's a fact of totalitarian societies. That, that's a fact in, in other societies you do business. If you want to do business in, in Vietnam, you want to be careful what you say as well. You want to respect the local customs. You want to respect the local uh, political systems. You've probably been reading a lot lately about certain companies that have been making 
uh, political statements that have been damaging their brands in, uh, in, in China. And as I said at the beginning of this presentation, I make it very clear to people that you can have your own political viewpoints and just be open to other people's and be open to the idea that uh, and now I'm going to say something political, but now you you know your own government isn't as clean as you might think it is, and as wonderful and upstanding as you think it is. That's the end of my political speech. But the opportunities in this society in this country are just endless. I I, I heard years ago when I went to China, I said, you can't afford to not be a player in China, and I think that that's so much the case now, tenfold to what it was then. Um, and the opportunities, what you, what's interesting about, back to my previous slide about the different tiers, is that if you look at some of these cities in the tier four, for sure, um, a lot of ideas that, that you might have, um, you know, going to tier one, you look at Shanghai. I mean, when I first went to Shanghai, it was pretty difficult to get a decent cup of coffee. I mean, in 2007, 2008, and before that, it was difficult to find a decent cup of coffee. Now, it's absolutely saturated. You have Starbucks on every corner. You have all these independent uh, mom and pop uh, operations. So it's become a, uh, uh, an easy thing to access. Whereas, you know, like I said, 10, 15 years ago, so in these tier four cities, if you go and have a look at some of these cities or tier three cities, a lot of these ideas maybe are ideas that you might have that you can exploit there, you can use there, you can utilize and you can grow. Um, so I guess the point being is that it's just a, it's still a land of opportunity, but you need to pick where that opportunity is and where how you, you need to do some research to decide what area you want to start in. So it's such a vast place. Where do you want to go? Do you want to go to the it's like saying I want to set up a business in Canada or the United States. Do I want to go to New York or do I want to go to Omaha? Well, if I go to Omaha, I'm probably going to have a lot more opportunities in certain areas, a lot less competition. But maybe if I am successful, I might get less of a pie, a uh, piece of a pie. So same with China. There's so many different locations, so many different opportunities. It's just doing your research and, and going there and figuring out for yourself what, you know, what, what the opportunities could be and where you could develop them more clearly. And of course, we have the opportunity of e-commerce, which is absolutely booming um, and hugely efficient. Um, you order something generally and it arrives with you the same day or the next day. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty efficient and, and well-organized. Um, but e-commerce is such a growing thing and it allows people in, on this side of the world um, to very easily with tools such as Alibaba, with, with setting up WeChat stores, which, which you know, I have plenty of contacts that, that can do that. Uh, we, we also do it. Um, but setting up WeChat, your own WeChat store where you can tap into this market without actually physically being in the market. Now, I do say if you're going to tap into it without physically being in it, at least go over and look at it and figure out whether it's for you. I mean, don't do everything remotely. I think it's really worth your time to get over there and explore and see the tremendous opportunity, tremendous growth and tremendous progression of this, this society, which 40 years ago was, you know, the, some of these cities were fishing villages and now they're cities with, you know, 25 million and, you know, incredible GDPs and, and just booming, you know? So it's just a, um, I was asked the other day what, is difficult for me coming back to North America. And I say there's the speed of life, adjusting to the speed of life. It's quite slow here when you've been uh, hustling around Asia for, for uh, 15 plus years, um, in particular in Shanghai and in Hong Kong, where I've spent a bit of time as well. It's, it's, uh, it's a big transformation, but uh, e-commerce is something that you guys can really look at because it's just an inexpensive um, way of getting, dipping your toe in the market and the barriers to entry are, are almost negligible. I mean, it's just an easy way for you to get, to get into uh, that, that market. Andrew, uh, uh, there's now four questions. Are you ready to? I'm ready to hit them, sure. All right, first question. What types of consumer protection do they have in China? What types of consumer, which, sorry? Protection. Oh, well, you know, again, that's something that's advancing leaps and bounds from when I first went there. Um, there's a lot more protection than there was. Um, but, you know, Western companies that do business there, they do, uh, you, you know, need to follow Chinese law and, and work with a good attorney, a good lawyer. And uh, there's all kinds of, of ways of protecting, but it's also 
uh, you have to be very careful. You have to be, you know, there, there are IP challenges and there are, as, as far as the hardware or the actual system has advanced greatly, there's still a lot of people that maybe aren't respecting those, those new laws and regulations. But the IP rules and regulations in some ways are getting more advanced than they are here. I mean, they're developing rapidly. So there's plenty of consumer protection, but you know, it's like anything and anywhere. If you have a good idea, your idea can be copied anywhere. It can be copied in the United States, it can be copied in Britain, uh, but there are safeguards um, to, to um, guarding your IP. Do health products have to pass any kind of tests? Yes, they do in some cases. Um, I've seen cases where products have been directly uh, gotten on the shelves when they've put the ingredients listed. Uh, with, it's, it's actually a requirement when selling um, anything in China that's a FMCG, a product like a fast moving consumer good uh, or a grocery type product is to put the ingredients label in Chinese. Uh, I've seen a lot of these products just pass through customs and I've seen some products be held up and more questions be asked. So uh, they, do, they do have testing requirements, uh, not any different from the testing requirements we have, but there are loopholes in certain products like, for instance, the nutrition and supplement industry in Canada, the country I'm in right now, um, is very, uh, you can just put a label on something and put it on the shelf. And as long as it doesn't kill anybody, I think you're good to go, uh, although they're tightening that up. Uh, answering the question, there are some requirements. It just depends on a case by case, province by province city by city and uh, and um, what your product is. Is shipping very expensive? It depends on your mode of shipping. So um, if you if time is your friend, uh, you put it on a ship and it's uh, negligible the cost. It's inexpensive depending on the size of what you're sending. Um, if you want to get something there the next day and you're using something like FedEx and it can be very expensive, uh, we send a lot of samples. Um, of Western products to China. And when we do, we usually tap into our network who are continuously traveling back and forth from uh, Vancouver to Shanghai or Vancouver to Beijing, et cetera. And we, we just get them to bring those samples along with them, which is perfectly acceptable and nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, uh, answering the question, sorry, uh, going by ship takes several weeks, but it's very cost effective. If you want it there right away and you want to put it on a plane, it can be prohibitively expensive depending on the product. Can they knock off your products? Uh, very easily, but they can. there's a lot more rules and regulations around that, and it depends on the product and whether it's worth knocking off, but they can knock off your products in New York City just as easily. Um, and there are rules and regulations on their side, and they're much more intense and severe than they were 10 or 15 years ago. No further questions. Back to you. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about e-commerce, and then I was jumping to the next slide, which is uh, e-commerce is expected to be 1.7 trillion USD by 2020. Um, and we're past 2020, and everything I've been told is that they're at 1.7, but COVID did have some impact, actually bringing the numbers up in some cases. Um, so, uh, right, so what is it people are generally uh, looking to buy? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm finding that the apparel space, and this is the reason I put 2011, is because this is the, the, the best available data that I could find. Um, is 2011, but there are other sources that I'm not sure of the validity of those sources. From my own observations and from the people I speak to on the ground, apparel is going down uh, that's being bought, luxury apparel, because luxury goods can be bought very easily in China. There's a lot of domestic China luxury brands that are beginning to, there used to be a perception among my a Chinese friends that Chinese products were inferior and that perception is gone now. Um, that those products are of equal uh, quality, in some cases of superior quality. Um, household goods, they buy, of course, um, consumer electronics, books and audio. And these are coming from all over the world. Um, and what I've mentioned before is cosmetics is a very big one. And that number has gone up considerably. Um, cosmetics generally come from places like Korea, but they do have cosmetics. I've been involved with a couple of deals with UK companies going over and setting up in, uh, in, uh, in China. Um, so you have those opportunities. Um, but really I say to people that as the tier one cities 
um, become wealthier, become more middle class, become more disposable income as they are, um, people's attitudes are changing. People are more interested in quality of life, less interested in long work hours, less interested in, uh, more interested in healthy lifestyles. And the old work-life balance is a, becoming a big thing there, which it wasn't before. So people are, in my observations and the observations of people that I, I'm in communication with, people are more interested in leisure activities, leisure travel. Um, education is always a big one and will always be a big one. Um, whether that be internal or external. So the, the opportunities are just enormous on pretty much anything you can think of has a shot with a population that size, depending on what the competition is, what the barriers to entry are, and what's already competing there. Andrew, uh, my own question. Uh, yes. When you refer, refer to tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four cities, can yes. you give me an idea of population size per tier? Uh, no, they're, they're not uh, not necessarily graded by population size. What I can say is if I go back a few uh, slides here. Uh, yeah, excuse me. So Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Shenzhen are all north of uh, well north of 20,000, uh, 20 million, sorry. Um, the cities underneath uh, Tianjin, I'm not sure. I'm thinking that's more around 15 million. Ningbo, I believe, is in the sort of seven area. Uh, million area could be if you count the the external areas. Um, these are all massive cities. You know, I I used to get um, Roger. I used to get invitations to go and speak uh, on behalf of the university or on my own um, at various cities, and I get called. And nine out of ten times, I would have never heard of them. Uh, yet they'd be cities that would have two, three, four, five million people, and I wouldn't even know of their existence. And certainly, most Western people. Uh, and I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but would certainly not be familiar with the tier three and tier four on here, most of them anyway, and probably not even the tier twos, maybe not even some of the tier ones. Um, so, but they're all massive cities, but certainly the ones on the top level, um, are top, top tier are Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen are mega cities uh, and growing, constantly growing. Thank you. Of course. So what I'd like to, um, suggest here, and then we can open the floor up to some questions if we have time, um, is that, you know, anybody here, you're all at different stages of your business. And for, for someone to come in and sort of try and please everybody and give information for everybody in a shorter space of time is very challenging. So I'm more than open uh, to set up uh, discovery calls with any of you, uh, whatever your product might be, and give you some advice, point you in the right direction. If it's, uh, if it's the case that we go on to do something together uh, through our organization, that's great, but I'm happy to point you in the right direction, give you advice. Um, and uh, my email is right here. I believe it's in the chat as well. Uh, O-B-O-R, which stands for One Belt, One Road um, at Outlook.com. Um, I've also got some other modes on here of ways that you uh, might be able to or might want to contact. Uh, Twitter is at Andrew Woods too. Uh, on LinkedIn, the business is ADW China ASEAN Consulting Group. And the website is www.onebeltoneroad.ca. And for the UK, it's onebeltoneroad.co.uk. Uh, for those of you that are on WeChat, reach out on Woods A8, and uh, we can be connected on WeChat as well. Uh, but any of you that have an idea, a concept, uh, you know, and if it's even just a sounding board where it's, you know, might this work, might this not work, fire it away to me, fire an email to me, and we'll get on the phone, we'll do a Zoom call, and we'll just explore. And if I don't know the answer, or it's an area that I haven't had experience in the past, I'll find you the answer uh, pretty quickly. No questions, Andrew. Okay. Not at all. Does anybody have any specific question or they prefer to ask that personally? And Serena is going to send you an email. Suzanne, Suzanne wants to know if you have a Twitter account. Yeah, uh, right here at, at Andrew Woods too. And I must say that that I, I, I mentioned at the beginning saying that I like to keep in touch with people. So I kept my Twitter alive when I was in... Uh, in China, but when you get there in that ecosystem, your whole life revolves around uh, WeChat. Uh, but I certainly do have a Twitter account and use it quite regularly. So very happy to uh, correspond via there as well. 
Jason wants uh, you to make a comment on recent cracking down on education group. And uh, JRM wants to know how popular are gyms, G-Y-M-S in China. Uh, oh, well, let me let me hit that one first. Gyms in the tier one cities are absolutely booming. As I mentioned before, there's a huge shift. Uh, it When I first went over, and it's so incredible the speed at the way things move. Um, when I first went over there, a lot of people were really obsessed with earning. And if you look at the history, I, I, it makes sense, you know, but, but getting up the ladder, earning. And now I'm finding that people are more into leisure, more into fitness, more into gyms are sprouting up everywhere in the tier one cities. I mean, everywhere. Um, so there's, there's, but there's massive opportunity based on the population. And if I were in the situation of wanting to open a gym there, I would find a way to partner with someone there and, uh, and look at the, the smaller cities that are kind of going through their more rapid development stage now. I think that, in my opinion, the tier one cities are quite saturated in that area. And again, ha happy to point you in the right direction. Sorry, Roger. Beg your pardon. The first question about cracking down on education group. Um, okay, can I have a little bit more um, context on that? Is there one group in particular that you're, you're meaning or is it education in general? Jason, if you would like to unmute and uh, verbally answer that for Andrew. Yeah, yes, um, uh, in the last uh, 10 days, the uh, Chinese government has issued a directive uh, at uh, all the educational group for uh, off school time, um, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the homework helping type of uh, education. Oh, yes, I saw that. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, it, it's well known that uh, uh, the kids, uh, Chinese kids, are well under, under a lot of stress and, uh, and the pressure to go through Gaokao in order to get into uh, college. And some of the best students come to uh, USA. Uh, uh, Australia or uh, England for uh, for college, so they are under a lot of pressure. But uh, suddenly, this uh, last uh, ten days, uh, uh, the government uh, intervened and so caused a crash of all the public uh, educational company that are in that space. And do you have any uh, see any uh, insights on the what they are thinking and? Uh, um, any, any, any comments? Okay. Um, interesting because I had this conversation earlier today with one of my former colleagues, um, professor in, in, uh, in Shanghai. Um, and, uh, no, I mean the, 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 the crackdown, well, first of all, putting it in context that you might not be familiar what, with, with what, uh, Jason just mentioned, which is the Gaokao. And that is a, a one shot deal that you have a test and it's a one shot deal basically to get into a decent university and that can affect your whole life. So living, growing up in a society or living in a society where uh, primarily it was a one child uh, only policy, which of course, most of you know has changed, um, the tremendous amount of pressure that was put on the child to succeed um, uh, created an entire industry of uh, education, after school education groups, um, uh, language schools, uh, you know, music schools. And um, without warning, uh, the, the government um, last week su suggested that they were going to close or clamp down on these, uh, some of these uh, more rogue um, uh, uh, operations. I don't know, Jason, and this was the conversation today, whether this is to uh, take pressure off people. I think my own take on it, and I could be entirely wrong. So that's my, my little uh, uh, warning indemnity. Um, my own take on it is that the the uh, government with a, with a demographic situation, so you have a, a very rapidly aging population in China right now, which, which again, which I haven't hit on if you're involved in any uh, products to do with older age, that's a big opportunity for you. I should have hit on that earlier. Uh, but with the rapid aging of the population and the because of the one child policy, less people to replace them, it might be perhaps that the encouragement of having more children, a lot of people are not having more children because of the sheer enormity of the cost 
of raising these children in particular in the bigger cities like Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Beijing. It's prohibitively expensive to raise one, let alone multiple. So maybe in my opinion, and again, I could be wrong, in my opinion, it, it's something put together to alleviate the pressure on the parents' pocketbooks that they need to be spending all of this money. And I think also the appreciation of the people that, that you know, I, I, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, people would always ask me, what university did you go to? What was the ranking? What was the ranking? That was always the first question. What was the ranking? Was it number one? Was it number two? Was it number three? If it was below that, nobody seemed to want to know. Um, I think that pressure is maybe easing as parents and people are beginning to become wealthier and sort of move up the, I don't know if you want to look at a Maslow's hierarchy of needs or they're, they're moving up so rapidly and no time in history has that happened in a society, but they're evolving so quickly in these tier one cities into wealth that maybe they're wanting to give their children that sort of freedom and life and, and more time to enjoy life as opposed to, to uh, cramming. One last point. On my, on my um, street that I lived on, you know, at the beginning of the summer, it was horrific. You would hear 20 violins playing and, and the sound was just awful. And by the end of the summer, it would sound like the New York Philharmonic. I mean, these kids would go from, uh, in their spare time, studying multiple hours of this music and would become quite talented after such a short time. The effort these people put into um, bettering themselves. It's one of the many things I admire about living in China or the Chinese people is this desire to better. Um, and maybe people are less inclined now to work so hard. I don't know. Question from Antoine. Uh, what's your consultation fee? Uh, Antoine, I suggest you contact Andrew directly and have that conversation. Yeah, I'll just jump in without mentioning dollar figures and say, well, my offer to you now is if you want to talk to me for half an hour, Antoine, where uh, it's going to cost you nothing. Um, then we can we can take it from there. Question from Jason. Would you make your products in China and sell directly? I think uh, Jason means and sell directly into China. Um, that's that's an interesting point. Um, it depends on the products, Jason. So, so if, if, if you're going for the health angle and you're saying this is, a, let's say it's from uh, the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia, um, you know, then it defeats the purpose if you're producing that in China using the water there and the, the products there. So that would sort of take away from the kudos of it being a, but if it's a product that can be easily, if it's a widget, as uh, a terrible example, but you know, if it's something like that, that could be produced there that you feel is unique, then of course it would be a, a cost-effective, I've been experimenting uh, with one of my clients with alcohol and the idea of producing that alcohol to eliminate the huge import duties associated with, uh, with, with uh, importing alcohol, again, depending on the region you're importing it into, uh, of developing the alcohol there, but then it would be, it would be, <coughs> excuse me, it'd be U UK recipe, you know, it'd be UK recipe, UK brand, but brewed and distilled in, in China, a little bit different. Depends on the product. Please get in touch with me and I can find out more information. No problem. So Chris wants to know, do you have a website for Americans? And I'm going to expand his question into, is anything you have said, would it be different if your online audience were all Americans as opposed to a smattering of Canadians and Americans and elsewhere? Not at all. I think that that certainly th there's no secret that, that uh, America and uh, China and law have been in a competition for years. Um, those of us that have spent time over there have been much more aware of that than the greater population now. But I think you're going to see, and there was a recently an article in The Economist, which is highlighting that this competition can actually be healthy if it's viewed in a, in a, in a proper manner. Um, no, I would, I would tell any American to that uh, the average Chinese knows how to sell to you. So why don't you take some time and learn how to sell to them? Uh, there's huge opportunities there. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change at all. I think there's great opportunities and there's always going to be areas in which the two countries don't agree as superpowers, one uh, developing superpower and rising power and one established uh, um, superpower. I think there's always going to be areas in which there's disagreement, but you know, it, it, there's always going to be disagreement between countries and nations. That's the way it is. I would not change a word I, I have said. Suzanne wants to know, do you have any resources that you recommend for cultural faux pas and the other flip side best practices? 
yes, um, yeah, there, there's um, literally thousands of books out there that I can I can sort of uh, if you send me an email I can I can drop you a, a list of, of, of a few of them that I recommend. Um, but I, I'm glad you asked that question because I think that's the most important thing. The, the days of the swaggering into China and sort of saying, okay, we're going to do it our way are, are long gone. Uh, people need to adapt and realize it's a totally different culture and they have different ways of doing things. Um, and the, the Western side needs to be more accommodating, in my opinion. Um, and the Chinese, in my opinion, over the years have been super accommodating to Western organizations uh, looking to, to get going. So it's so, sort of what's called a win-win. And, and, uh, but cu cultural, uh, it's such a great question because it's so important. It's so important. Relationships can be blown. Uh, the perception of time, it's the old adage that the Chinese side of a negotiation generally wants to know the people over time. Um, someone mentioned America. Traditionally, American business is straight and direct and to the point. This causes conflict. When people know that, it doesn't cause conflict. When you know the other side you're negotiating well, you will avoid all conflict and they will respect you. So very good question. Send me an email and I'll send you some resources. Uh, Suzanne, I've given you uh, Andrew's uh, email address to tee up a time with him. Uh, question from short and sweet, Ryan Tierney, simply has a, a, a one word, tutoring. I think he want, the question is, what's the market for tutoring in China? What's the market for what, Roger? Tutoring, T-U-T-O-R-I-N-G. Tutoring, as in, as in, um, you know, just, uh, giving help to students in math and science, uh, homework tutoring. Yes. Okay, sorry, it just broke up there, so I didn't catch what you're saying. Um, huge market. Um, they, they, there's lots of uh, established online, some of them NASDAQ listed and uh, stock, New York Stock Exchange listed companies um, that do language tutoring where their um, people are the people are um, uh, sitting in the US and Canada and various countries and provide Zoom uh, uh, language instruction. There's also a lot of um, uh, high school tutoring uh, that goes on. Typically, uh, that's something that I would recommend to people depending on your age, depending on your how, uh, how deeply you're dug into where you are. If you have uh, the ability to be mobile, you can make a good um, and I often recommend to people that are going over to explore ideas, go over uh, as someone who does tutoring or teaching or because the market for that is massive. I can't, there, there's such a shortage of English language teachers in China. Um, and it's a great way to dip your toe. And I've known so many people that have started doing that for a year and gone on to start major uh, companies, but they've taken the time to learn the language. They've taken the time to learn the culture and to simulate there are massive amounts of tutoring opportunities on the ground there, but also some of them remotely. I do have a list, I'd have to dig it out for you, but I do have a list of language schools and tutoring companies. If you drop me an email, I can, for, I can uh, drop you that list back. Question from Amanda. For those who might not get to visit China anytime soon, can we still do business remotely? Uh, yes, and that would be all of us that can't visit anytime soon. Um, uh, the, the, the quarantine set up there and the, the way it's working is that it's uh, unlikely to become loose, loosened up until after the Beijing Olympics of, uh, of next year, of Winter Olympics. Um, doing things remotely very easily. I mean, just as you can set up an eBay account here, you can set up an Alibaba account very simply and sell directly uh, to Chinese. Uh, if you want to go a little bit further, you can set up WeChat accounts. Um, I know people that do that, including people on my own uh, staff. Um, very easy to do that as well. Um, so yeah, you can definitely take and and I say, I say start small. You know, start small, get 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 a feel for it, and see what works and what doesn't work. And you might be surprised what you think. And this is a part of getting to know the culture. What you think uh, won't be a big seller might be a massive seller, and what you think might be a big seller might not work at all. Totally different market. JRM wants to know how people pay for products in China, cash or credit card? Uh, credit cards are basically non-existent. Credit cards were leapfrogged over. The only use for credit cards in China is if you are going traveling abroad, in my opinion. Most people pay by, by um, uh, WeChat, Alipay, which are just mobile, rather like Apple Pay, where it's on your phone. 
Um, interesting enough that, that a lot of people don't have laptops as well. They sort of leapfrogged over laptops as well. So it's more, more things are done on mobile phones. So I always tell people, if you're setting up a business, make sure it's a mobile phone website that you set up and adding to that websites aren't used very often either. It's generally WeChat that's used. Question from Zarina. You mentioned cosmetics. My partner has a cosmetic manufacturing company in the United States. We would love to find out how to export face cream. Okay, send me an email. We'll set up a call. No, no charge to you, 30 minutes, and uh, we can explore all the options. And then if you want to take it further, we can take it further. From Paolo, I would love to receive the information related to the tutoring business. Thank you. And Paolo gives you an email address. Now I'll be sending you a copy of the chat. Paolo, it might be better if you make a note of Andrew's email and set up a time to talk to him. Yeah, that would be that would be better. And uh, and just also in the emails, remind me of what the conversation is. I just don't say it's Paolo from the from the group. Remind me about the tutoring part, if you don't mind. JRM wants to know, how do you find a good Chinese interpreter? Oh, um, there's plenty of agencies that do that. Again, I have a list of those. Um, I always, and I highly recommend that people, uh, very often the other company will recommend an interpreter. That's not a good move uh, for, for obvious reasons. Um, when in negotiation, it's best to get your own interpreter. Um, I've known people, it depends on the, the level of experience that you want. I've known people go to universities and find interpreters. I've known people go to professional companies, but make sure that your interpreter is with you and on your side and not necessarily on the side of the other party, which is common sense. Um, and a lot of people, when they go over now, they bring someone who does speak China, Chinese. It's uh, quite easy to find someone who speaks Chinese and uh, they go over with them when they're doing business, uh, their own employee or their own person. Um, but yeah, I can send you a list of people that I've used in the past. Uh, this is a little bit of an old list. I can see if I can find an updated one. Heyman wants to know, uh, what are the modes of payment in China? I think you've dealt with that. But the new question is, and how do we get the money moved from China to Canada or the US? Uh, okay. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, you're definitely correct that there is a cap on the amount of money that you can move out. It depends on where you set up your um, and what you're selling and how you set it up. So if you are selling via uh, uh, WeChat, for example, you'd have a WeChat account and you can transfer some of that money out. Uh, and what, what we found recently is my wife has just recently joined me here in Vancouver is a large percentage of the of the, of the, of the uh, restaurants and stores around here actually take WeChat in, in, in RMB. Um, it depends on what you set up. If you set up an actual company there, if you're, if you're really going for shooting for something major, um, it's very easy to get your money out um, depending on how you structure and set up that company. That's a lengthy conversation. Um, so that I would suggest that be more of a, of a case-by-case uh, -case basis and that would probably warrant an email. Suzanne has a question about negotiation. Do they still push you until you squeal? Should you get a particular type of legal representative? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by push you until you can squeal. Um, uh, you mean hard negotiations. Very hard negotiators. Um, and you need to negotiate hard back. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's changed a lot because contracts have a lot more weight, but it used to be that the contract wasn't worth the paper it was written on. Um, uh, but that's changing a lot as the, as the legal system uh, uh, advances. Uh, depending on your product, depending on what you're doing, uh, depending on, on who you want to partner with or how you want to set things up. Um, it's a case by case basis, but definitely very good negotiators. But uh, it's interesting. I mentioned at the beginning of this that uh, I used to run workshops at, at EM Lyon, the French school in uh, the French university in, um, in uh, Shanghai, the, the Asian campus. And we used to do negotiations between the French and the Chinese. So half the class were Chinese students, half the class were French students. And it was fabulous watching these negotiations. And nine out of 10 times, in my opinion, the Chinese side was far better prepared. Um, but it just depends on being prepared, doing your homework and knowing what you're, what you're prepared to do and what you're not prepared to do and sticking to it. And market, uh, Heman, market for most products is saturated in China. 
how do I identify a niche market for products at a price level of 25 to hundred dollars when we are located outside of China and have to manage the business remotely? Well, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. A lot of the people I've known, and I think I just mentioned this a few minutes ago, a lot of the people I've known that have been truly successful in China have just up sticks and gone there. Now that's not possible for a lot of people, but it is possible for some people. Uh, I knew a woman in Vancouver who um, went over to China several years ago and slept on the factory floor, um, watching them do things and watching the and learning the environment and learning the, the the culture. If you have time, get over there and spend a few months. If you're not able to find someone you know or trust to do the legwork for you, um, and I would suggest that it, unless your product is truly unique, that you start looking at the cities that are less uh, developed or less advanced in some ways, uh, have more opportunity, um, and maybe even look at other markets. I know this is about China, but but certainly there's other uh, markets in uh, Southeast Asia that are expanding massively, Vietnam being one of them, where you'd also have incredible opportunities and less uh, saturated in those areas. So. No further questions. And if you could move to closing <clears throat> remarks, Andrew, that would be wonderful. That's fabulous. <clears throat> um, great. So we'll stop the share. Well, closing remarks, really, there's just incredible opportunity, guys. I, I don't think, I think people should not fear it. I think people should embrace the differences. Get out there, have a look. When the time is right and when it's opened up again uh, for travel, get over, have a look, whether it be two weeks or two months or two years and figure out what it is you want to do and tap, find a way to tap into that market. I mean, it's just, I can't, I can't stress how many opportunities there are. And uh, it's just a, a great challenge. And I think that the, the, I, the whole notion that the, you know, oh, there's conflict between the West and the East and yes, there is. And there always will be, uh, in my opinion, for a very long time, there's going to be a great power competition between China and the West, but that doesn't mean that you can't get out there and hustle and sell stuff because, you know, they haven't stopped selling the Chinese people haven't stopped selling to us. So it's about time we found ways to sell our own unique products uh, to the Chinese market. Great opportunity. And anything I can do to help you, I just want to see more people doing it. If, if it works out to be a working relationship, fabulous. If it works out that I meet a new person and, and help them on their journey, fabulous as well. Just uh, get out there and do it. Andrew, on behalf of EIN and uh, the 80,000 entrepreneurs I represent, I thank you hugely for sharing this uh, current boots on the ground, frontline perspective on the opportunities in China. You have uh, given us some very fresh perspectives and very current perspectives. And for those, I thank you hugely. Really appreciate it, guys. Look forward to uh, reading your emails. <laughs>